Hey everybody and welcome to the Sober Full podcast. I'm Veronica. And I am Chip. And we are going to talk about a subject. We keep coming up with subjects so we're like, I can't believe we haven't talked about that. I know. <laughs> Do you think one day we'll run out? I don't think so. I think there's I've... enough... I think we well maybe we'll be able to repeat some and people will be so old they won't remember that they've <laughs> been done previously. No. I've met I've met several people who've said uh, I love your podcast and I've started from the beginning and I'm like flipping I know. Egg. I know. You got some got some <laughs> I'm I'm going to just warn you there was there's a couple of dud episodes in the first year when we weren't really sure what we were doing I think there was a couple of ones that weren't great but I think we get into us I think we're in our stride now so I would think so yeah yeah there was one where it there's one called where it all went wrong because it yes. did all go wrong yeah 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 <laughs> god I can't believe you can remember that one we're no. at the, yeah we're at two, two this will be the 270th episode so it's bloody yeah, hell there's a lot lot to get through okay yeah um if uh, if you love the podcast, please just give us a rating on whatever platform that you listen to. Subscribe, or follow us, whatever, and then you won't miss an episode and it will appear in your little podcasting app, whatever uh, way you get to uh, listen. Uh, we are going to talk about complacency. Yes. And complacency in our sobriety and complacency, yeah, just complacency in general, but how critical that is to um our sober journey have you been complacent in your recovery when has that happened that happened when i moved from bury st edmunds where the rehab had been the way you worked and trained mm -hmm. uh, when we moved from there and we moved to this little village here um i was i used to be a frequent attender at self-help meetings and things like that and there were none around here, and I kind of thought, okay, well, and I can remember going to London to work, but that would have been an opportunity to kind of connect with old friends and people, but I didn't. And I think there was probably about three years where I hardly did any kind of recovery work at all, and I definitely noticed the difference. I think... I mean, I feel really strongly about compl I think complacency is one of the biggest causes of relapse out there. I, I agree. So you were, at this point, you were over 30 years sober, weren't you? Yes. Were you? Yeah. About that? Yeah. So, I, oh, so I was, what, yeah. Over yeah. 30 years sober. And so one would think, like, what's the problem? Yeah. What? And you said, so what did you notice? What, what? I just, I was just not as thoughtful. I was because I, I don't know what goes on for me at a twelve-step meeting, but I just know that it keeps me more grounded. It keeps me centered. It keeps me kind of just sort of aware that I need to try and behave as the best version of myself. And I think what happened was that I was uh, things like getting really, really angry on the roads. I was probably quite short with Heidi. Uh, I was just not the version of myself that I normally am. Now, I mean, I remember at one point she said, you haven't been to a meeting for ages, have you? You know, and I thought, and I started my kind of usual thing. Well, they're not very good around here. And, you know, but actually I went, no, you're right, aren't you? And then I started picking up and I found a regular meeting uh, that was really good. And it made such a difference to my life, being able to talk to people in the way that we, when people are in sobriety, there's a, there's a, con, or such an authentic connection mm. with other people in sobriety that is so valuable. And I, mm. I think that's what I'd lost. I'd lost authentic connections with me. Obviously mm. I had one with Heidi, but outside of that, I was having trivial conversations with people. Mm. Nobody was talking about their emotional. I was playing golf a lot with people who did not talk about their feelings in any way, shape or form. And yeah, I just kind of drifted in it. I didn't feel like, I didn't sort of think, oh God, I'm getting close to having a drink. But I definitely was aware that I wasn't myself. But in terms of actually relapsing back into alcohol use, 
I think when you unpack that with the person who's relapsed, if you're able to, and I do say if you're able to, because it doesn't always happen that people come back from relapses. Um, if you're able to do that and you start to unpack, well, when did it start going wrong? I think nine times out of 10, the person will have drifted away from the things that they found really helpful at the first place. Whatever they found helpful, whether it's 12-step meetings, online groups, reading, podcasts, whatever it is that they found helpful when they first got sober, they drifted away from that. And I think the complacent mark big is, a, is around about three years. I think that's the time to really pay attention. But I mean, I, it's stupid to put a kind of figure on it. But I just think in principle, when you unpack most people's relapse, it'll be because they've drifted away from the things that helped them when they first got sober. Yeah, it, it's I always make this comparison. It's like, I don't know if you you had a really bad back and, and you, you know, need to get flexible and you go to yoga and you, you, you know, really do that and that's your main thing and, and you just notice the difference and it just feels so much better and you do it and you, you've got a practice and then you just stop yep. and you stop and then in a few months you're not going to feel the physical benefits you, you, your, your back's going to get tight again you're not it, it's the same as that so I have done it well definitely more than once I was pretty consistent my first 10 years I am um, because for me it was it, it wasn't about Initially, it was about the drinking, but very quickly, it came about the um, uh, my mental health and my yeah. emotional well-being. Is that I very yeah. quickly made the connection with the work that I did, and it wasn't just going to meetings; it was the the self reflection inventory that I do. That 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 really got me in a good place. Like I really that that's what changed my life. Yeah. So for me, it was when I had my first baby and I just, I just moved to America. So I didn't, I, I just moved to America. I didn't have my green card yet. And I actually was going to a lot of meetings because I didn't have a job. It was really weird. It was so weird. I was 37 and I'd left, left my country. I couldn't work yet. Like it was like, I went from this really busy life to like nothing, nothing. I didn't even have yep. a bank account. My, my husband had to give me cash. And um, I, I went to the gym and I went to a meeting every day because I just didn't have anything else. And it was really strange. Yeah. And then um, I, I, so I met lots of people in AA quite quickly and then I got pregnant and, and then I had a baby that didn't sleep very well and I was exhausted and I stopped doing everything. I just stopped. I was so, I was just crawling through the day. And I remember having this vague kind of like, I've always been warned not to do this, to, to not, not go to meetings not do my inventory I've been warned that I shouldn't but and I was like all I do is stay home with the baby like it's not like I'm doing much it'll be fine and then what happened at, at about 11 months sober everything that my husband did pissed me off mm -hmm. the way he put the milk in the fridge the way yeah. our neighbor walked past our apartment door and and it took me a few weeks and this has always served me really well when I'm okay with me I don't have to make you wrong. And, oh, and that's, that good. Came, that's good. I and like that, that came into my head. My sponsor taught me that. That oh, I'm gonna I was that not I was not okay. Yeah. Because I was starting to just pick at just the littlest, stupidest things. And that took a few weeks of me doing that for me to go, oh, I'm not okay. And here's what's beautiful. I you know, had a baby. So I think I was able to struggle to one meeting a week. Uh -huh. And I was able to kind of, I started doing my self reflection inventory in the middle of the day when the baby was sleeping, sure, maybe, sure. maybe three or four times a week, maybe. It still worked. It's, yeah. I remember about a month later, kind of going, Oh, yeah. I just, I feel better. Yeah. And it, it, it's really, and that's the big, that's the bottom line for me. When I start making other people wrong, I know I'm not all right. And, yeah. and so that, that I did that with my first child. Do you think I'd learn? After when I had my second child, three and a half years later, same thing. We just moved to a new place. I didn't know anybody. I had two very small children, a, ba a baby and a toddler. And I stopped again. And the same thing happened. A year, yeah. a, 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 you'd think I would, I'd learn and I didn't.
and and that's no. <clears throat> those are the two those are the oh i think i think i've got pl- complacent maybe not not to that degree like that was like a whole year of not going to any meetings not doing anything it doesn't work it doesn't no. work no and i think there's a i mean i think at the beginning of a sober journey we need a lot of help we are making a massive change and readjustment yeah. We're yeah. kind of having to learn how to live life in a completely different way, maybe in our forties or whatever age we are. Yeah. Um, thankfully, nowadays a lot more people are coming in much younger. But, uh, but we are having to do it, and so we need a lot of support. And you know, I, I, I got as much support as I possibly could in the first year, two years. Um, in fact, you know, I was quite committed to a lot of support. And then I think what happens to quite a few people, and I, you know, is that they go, okay, well, I'm I'm okay now. I I don't need to do all that work now. I can I'm okay. I'm I'm I can look after myself now. I've okay, and I I can almost hear people say it. Okay, I've got it. Yeah, I've learned. I've heard what you said. I've learned all the things I need to learn, um, and I'll be okay. And the thing that they lose, and you will obviously agree with this is they lose connection. They lose connection yes. with people and they become isolated. They become withdrawn from the groups or the people who might have helped them and been part of their recovery program. And they just become disconnected. And that complacency and disconnection, I think, go almost hand in hand. And I, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I hope I've always managed to maintain um a sort of degree of connection. I mean, I'm lucky that my, you know, my partner is in recovery and doesn't drink and everything. I think, uh, and obviously with my work, I'm always sort of reminded, but for people who are not constantly in the presence of, uh, of being around people who are actively drinking, it's very easy to forget what it was like. And, And I've always, you know, banged on about, the importance, because one of the criticisms you will have of meet sort of self-help meetings or things, like, oh, well, people are always talking about the past and they're always going on about the past. And, and I think, yeah, they do probably, but I don't mind that. I think it's good that we remind ourselves, <clears throat> why did I start this journey in the first place? Did I start this journey because my life was absolutely swimmingly brilliant? Or did I start this journey because things were going really badly wrong. And I think it's important to remember because I think give somebody with an alcohol problem six months and what was very bad drinking becomes, you know, what I always call the back of the yacht in Monte Carlo. And it's kind of, well, my drinking wasn't that bad. It was quite nice, actually. <laughs> we, you know, it's the summer and, you know... I think I can remember going for cocktail parties and things, and it was all very nice. And we forget <clears throat> what it was really like. And I think I'm a great one for remembering what it was like. And I think when we become complacent, we forget what it was really like. And that's why I have often advocated sort of having that photograph album of what your drinking was like. And every now and then, get it down off the shelf and have a look at it. And Okay, let's have a look at what's your drinking. And you go, oh, my God, it's bloody awful. Okay, well, then maybe you need to kind of, yeah, keep on putting it, become connected. Our capacity to be self-deluding is is quite extraordinary, isn't it, with alcohol? It's like, and it, it is, you know, you're right. At the beginning, uh, so I my clients hear me say this a lot. Early sobriety is not how it is long term, and in early sure. sobriety, you need a you need a lot of input and a lot of connection. Like, yeah, sobriety being sober has to be your main thing. Yep. Like, you need to do your laundry and do your job, but you sobriety needs to be your main thing. Like, that's how it has to be at the beginning, and then it just and then your your life just becomes in balance, and then you have to balance your life and all the wonderful opportunities that will come your way with making sure that you're maintaining your mental and emotional health. And, and that's how I always frame it is that I am very clear that there is, there's things I need to do to maintain my mental and emotional health, no matter how 
sober we are. It, yeah. it just doesn't matter. Um, and, and hopefully I've learned that lesson. I get, I get what you're saying. Like, I, I know what you mean. People say that about meetings and I, hearing people's drunkologues is not going to keep us sober. And it no. really depends on, on what no. meetings you go, you go to. There's lots of meetings that have lots of good solution in it yes. as well. And, yeah. you know, they do vary and you have to, and so, you know, I've, as you know, I've moved a lot and I, I've, every time I've moved, I have, once I've learned my lesson after those two complacent incidences, um, I know that I have to get embedded with a local group. And like where I live in Alabama, there's a Saturday morning women's group that I'm really starting to feel part of. It works mm -hmm. out for me most Saturday mornings and uh, they know my name now. And I was right. at the Christmas party. I went, went, made sure I went to the Christmas party because it's a chance to chit chat, mm -hmm. you know, and yep. just... Yep. And, and and I love it. it. It's just such a I, what I love about those those the different sobriety groups is that is that we are people who normally would not mix. Yeah. And we you just get this random and and we all have just real. It, it's the the depth of understanding each other. I that's what you can't replicate anywhere else. Is that just different backgrounds, different stories, and but there is a deep understanding between us that's non-verbal yes. almost isn't there yeah there is there is absolutely and and i've often said <clears throat> i can go anywhere in the world and i can find a self-help group and i can sit down next to a complete stranger yeah and if they say to me how are you doing i can go i'm really struggling at the moment actually um whatever and they'll go okay let's talk about it now there's very few uh, places where you can do it, and I just had a bit of an insight about that drunkalog thing, and it's and we're not here, you know, going. Everybody must go to twelve step meetings and things. That's entirely yeah. your choice. I do think you need to be connected to some support group, but yeah, one of the criticisms about twelve step is it? Oh well, all you hear is a drunkalog, and I was thinking when you said that because I mean that is an, a, 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 a genuine criticism that people have. Yeah, and I'm thinking. Yeah, but actually, actually, stand back a little bit. That person who is doing that drunkalog is sitting in front of forty people, probably for the first time in their life, talking for twenty-five minutes, and most people can't even string together saying their name at a meeting. And yeah. that person is really struggling. They're really nervous. They're really, and all they know to talk about really is how their life used to be like. And, you know, yes, if every meeting I went to was a drunkalog, it would be get a bit tedious. But I think we need to give a little bit of leeway to, you know, if I'm just sitting there judging people and going, oh, well, and, and not saying anything, I was terrified. I didn't speak at a meeting for years. I mean, not for years, but for months. I yeah. just couldn't, I couldn't bring my, I was too nervous of judgment Same. and, yeah. and, you know, I think you need to give people a little bit of a break on that. But again, it's like going back to complacency. It's like, you know, we, I think we, you know, we, we are driving a car is, you know, when we first learn how to drive a car, we are super vigilant about how kind of we do things and the right way to do things. But my God, Give us a bit of time, and we become very sloppy drivers. We can't. We think we know the road. We don't. You know, it's it's like, yeah, I can go faster. I can take. You know, and we do get complacent about our driving skills mm. because we probably mm. haven't done anything to improve our driving skills since we were taught to drive x many years ago. But I think there's something about. I think it's quite inherent, and in we struggle to ask for help in the first place. It's a real big deal to ask for help. We ask for help. We get mm. told what to do. We do it for a little bit, but then there's a sort of, I'm almost going to say laziness creeps in about, yeah, okay. I, okay. I've heard it all. I've read it all. Um, I don't need to, you know, I've got, I've got it. Now. I've got, I've got what you mean. Understood. See you later. And the moment that disconnect comes in, that's when things start to go wrong because you can get away with a lot of, um, kind of stinking thinking. I know that's a real cliche, but you can get away with a lot of that <laughs> if you're not connecting with people. If it's just you know 
uh, you can get away with a lot of behavior, maybe all kinds of behavior you're getting up to that you're not talking about. You're not, and that's what to me that's complacency is about not joining in with the things that helped you in the first place. And I think when you start finding yourself and you haven't talked to anybody, as you said just now, if you haven't talked to anybody in sobriety for a month, where are you getting your help from? Yeah. Where, are you, where are you getting your help from? Where are you sorting? Because I don't believe anybody's uh, life is, you know, absolutely without issues and problems. And I just want to also back up what you said earlier on about it's so difficult, you know, that the first three months of recovery are probably the hardest three months. And, and yeah. it's really, I always say to people, look, I'm, you're just about to set off on a journey. The first three months are going to be very difficult. That is not what sobriety is going to be like. It sobriety no. is going to be, <laughs> it's not what it's like in the first three months. It's bloody hard work in the first three months. Yeah. But I think a good question to ask. Okay, when if you if you're in sobriety, when was the last time you spoke to somebody else in sobriety? Hmm. Actually, spoke and connected with them, and because I think we can delude ourselves, and that's a bit of complacency. Oh, I'm reading all sorts of things. I'm reading loads mm -hmm. of stuff. Oh, I listen to podcasts. Yeah, yeah. listen to podcasts. I'm reading loads. Of... Okay, great. That's good. That's a really good thing. It's a good part of your recovery. But, but when that's was the last... just information. That's yes. just information. And you can be very isolated doing that. You can be yes. completely isolated, not involved with anybody. But you're listening to podcasts and you're listening to reading books and things. But when was the last time you spoke to somebody else in sobriety? When did you speak to somebody who was you were friends with at the beginning? That, to me, would be a, a really big sign of complacency, that, that ending of connections with people that were helpful to you in the beginning. Yes. And, and uh, yeah, I just want to kind of emphasize a few things that we're talking about here. I mean, that, that is such a good point. There, there exists amongst sober people, whatever, you know, groups you go to, a level of knowing and understanding that I don't think you can get in many other places. We just, you know, I, I, that's the thing I love the most about what you're saying, going to like different meetings all over. Like, yeah, I yeah. don't know your name, but I know you. Yeah. I know you and you yeah. know me. Yeah. And so there's that sense of belonging and being understood that is so valuable. Um, and it's the complacency about what, after this got me sober, what, what I realized was this was about personal development. It was about maintaining my mental and emotional health. We don't do the, I mean, you're, is it 39 years sober? You're 39 yep. years sober? Yeah, yeah, 39 years. I, I just celebrated 24 years of sobriety. We, we're not yeah, doing that, this. Yeah. We're not doing this because we, I'm not thinking about drinking. I, I, I'm now in a really good routine of doing um, every morning uh, a meditation, a prayer. Mm -hmm. I do a little bit of structured journaling, self-reflection, like probably about four or five times a week. It just, keeps me really well balanced and a good I, I, like I love doing it I, I mm -hmm. because it just keeps me what's the word I'm looking for I just it keeps me re in really good mental shape yeah that's how it that's yeah. what it does for me it's not because I think I'm going to drink or anything like that uh, even when I was complacent those two times well the second time was uh, I never thought about drinking it wasn't that I wanted to drink it's my mental health really declined but the second time it was on the back of a uh, my youngest son had been diagnosed with lead poisoning, which is probably the worst thing that's happened to me in my sobriety. And um, I didn't have a support group. I didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. And I started fantasizing about self-harm. And I've, I've never self-harmed. In fact, I'm going to say I never truly understood it because I was always like numb the pain, not mm -hmm. create pain. I don't really get yeah. that. Um, and I did start fantasizing about cutting myself because I was in such pain as a mother that this had happened to my child. And um, it took me about two weeks of fantasizing about where I was going to do it for me to go off. Oh, I'm in trouble. Yeah, I'm yeah. in trouble. And that yep. day I made an appointment for a therapist. I went to an AM meeting. I told my husband how I felt. I, like that day I got back on it. And within about yep. three weeks, I felt so much more like, it, it's like, um, 
it's like our thinking gets like overgrown with weeds and you don't notice the odd weed. You just don't mm -hmm. notice the odd weed. And then before you know it, it's like, there's more weeds in my garden than there is flowers. Like, yep. how did that happen? And then you yep. have to kind of go in and get all the weeds out. What we're doing is we're just like maintaining a garden with, oh, there's a weed. Let's just get rid of that one. Let's just get it. And it's easy when you maintain it, right? When you just spend a few minutes going, oh, I've got those two or three. That, that, now we're back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you just let it go, the garden just gets overrun before you even know it. Before mm -hmm. you, and you just look at it one day. And, and that's kind of what had happened to my thinking. Okay, yeah. Because, uh, I mean, it's always good because when the other person's talking, I'm always thinking I'm listening, but I'm also thinking about other things as well. And then and, you get wiggly when you want to speak. Know, you get I know, wiggly. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a shame that they're now being recorded visually. Um, but yeah, I mean, it doesn't take long. It takes much quicker than people think. If people who've been drinking for 20 years, which is 10 to 20 years is the sort of average length. I mean, people do getting quicker, but whatever. But let's say 10 years. It doesn't take long to change from really, really needing a drink to being quite comfortable not drinking. I would say it takes yeah. about a month, maybe, yeah, month, six weeks tops before you're not really thinking about needing a drink at all. Um, but you are having to deal with life. And that's where at the beginning – support and help and other people telling and talking about the same stuff it wasn't about i really really need to have a drink although there are some people i know who kind of do struggle for quite a long time with wanting to drink but most of the people i know who get sober they don't spend a lot of time each day thinking god i really want to have a drink i really want to have a drink that's not what they need help with it's the how do i live this new life and what most people find is they get a wonderful feeling of connection. Their <clears throat> behaviors and their thought patterns are validated by listening to other people. And they hear other people sort of go say something and you're going, oh, yeah, I, I did that. I used to do that. I think that way. I listed, you know, and, and, and you feel kind of connected. I'm probably going to say that word too many times today. But um, I think it doesn't take long for alcohol not to be the problem takes much quicker than than we imagine but life becomes a problem very quickly and how to adjust to life and how to adjust to the fact that practically everybody i know in sobriety is initially shy and withdrawn and anxious a bit socially anxious and a bit uneasy at themselves no i don't know anybody who gives up drinking is super confident they all have to go through, as I did, this kind of growth of a slightly new person rather late in life, having to learn social skills and life skills and things like that. And I think that's where people forget is they think, well, I'm not worried about alcohol any longer. I don't have to. I'm not thinking about. It. So, you know, I don't really need this help. And that's where that's where the complacency can start to sink in is that, well, I'm not, I'm, you know, I went, just went to the pub and I didn't even think about drinking and a slight sort of sense of I've sorted it. I've cracked it. Yeah. Well, you, prob you probably have, you may well have cracked the, uh, the drinking, but I mean, there's a reason there's a phrase called being a dry drunk Yeah. because, you know, that's exactly what, you know, people become, very disconnected and they become very <clears throat> kind of this, very quick to anger maybe very quick to criticism maybe depression they're just they're just very quick to kind of showing signs of ill health um in all kinds of ways and it's got nothing to do with alcohol it's got to do with and i think if you can learn how to be aware of the sort of warning signs and I mean, I've come up with this one today was, you know, when was the last time you spoke? I mean, spoke to somebody in, 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 in recovery. And I speak, I go to a meeting a week anyway, I speak. But I, every time I'm in the car, I spend my car journeys talking to people in, in sobriety. And I get, you know, I have, it's great to have all that time just to be able to talk about what's going on, listening to what's going on in their life. And, you know, and with about three or four people, I've got this connection where i can be completely authentic completely honest um <clears throat> it might be talking about my home life it might be talking about heidi it might be talking about my children it might be talking about whatever but 
we are so blessed to have a forum where we can talk as authentically as that because everywhere else I go in life, I find it very difficult to find people where I can be authentic and really say what's on my mind. I mean, I know that I have always talked about the golf club, you know, and, you know, I love golf, but my God, you don't talk about, you're not authentic on the golf course. You talk about golf authentically, perhaps, but not talking about, I'm so tired. I mean, this has got nothing to do with complacency, but I'm so tired of walking along the fairway and somebody saying, what do you do? I'm a psychotherapist. Oh, I better be careful what I say then. Oh, okay. I'll be careful. All oh, right. Oh God. It's like, Oh, shut up. But I must have, I must have had that about 600 times and I am so tired of it. Oh God. Um, yeah, I am so tired of that. Um, but that's got nothing to do with complacency, but, um, but, it me... but what you're talking about is it, it, get sobriety is 10% not drinking and 90% emotional sobriety. Yes. yes. And we, we are organic creatures just, just because I, in the, you know, I got 27, I got sober. I learned a lot, a lot of things got sorted out. A lot has happened since then. <laughs> Yes. Right. A lot of life yeah. things have happened. Lot, yes. Lot of lot of very strong feelings and emotions. Yes. Lot, lot, lots of things, and I am constantly learning how to. I'm constantly learning how to navigate life. Yeah. And sometimes I don't always do it well. But I, you know what, Chip? I was talking about this with somebody the other day, and for me, and again, we've always supportive of everyone's pathway to sobriety. For me. The 12 steps just gave me a framework that I've, I didn't have before I had that. I didn't have anything solid. I didn't know how to do life. The 12 steps for me, I like when my back has been against the wall, which has been more than once, I do that. That what, and that somehow when I do that, the life thing that's going on around me works out. Mm hmm. When I try and mud, get my, what happens is when I go over to someone else's side of the street and start trying to manage outcomes and how I think yeah. it should be and what you should be doing, that usually becomes a bigger mess. When I just use this framework for managing life, my life seems to work out. And that I, I need it just as much as when I was 27 as I do at 51. And... Be, uh, being complacent that I don't need some kind of framework and community mm -hmm. that that's what I'd never want to get complacent about again I mean I really hope I've learned my lesson that those two two times really that I I did do it I think I've maybe do it did it minorly like you I think when I moved to Lake Tahoe I didn't seek out like there was this lot of snow and I didn't but no I did go to meetings I did get to know people I was maybe a little bit but I not really like I I hope I've learned my lesson but yeah. it's funny how our mind works isn't it it's funny it the things that we tell ourselves yep I mean whether you go to meetings or not AA meeting or NA meetings or what doesn't matter but there's nothing about the structure of the 12-step program that isn't mm. very emotionally healthy uh, yeah. Those those activities or and actions that it requires you to do or suggests that you do, yeah. there's nothing. There's none of those that aren't actually fundamentally very good things to do for somebody in yeah. sobriety. Um, and so, um, and actually, complacency is part of that because one of the sort of uh, step program is about maintaining the things that you know, making sure that you continue to take as they say, inventory, continue to take stock of yourself, continue to check on how you're leading your life, what support systems you have in place, what would happen if there was a crisis, you know, who would I turn to if something went yes. really wrong? You know, and it, and it will. The thing is, yes. it will. Yes. It's not going to not going to happen. Something yeah. is going to happen and you're going to need help and people and input. And yeah. when you've got that, when you've built that, it, it's a lot more easier like the times i've had to ask for help and i have i it's so much easier when you've invested in that community to be absolutely. able to go, go somewhere go i'm not i'm not all right I'm yeah not all right. absolutely and i think you know you're not going to get that with everybody but i like to say to people 
try and have three or four people in your life that you could call any time of day or night. And you, because crises don't necessarily happen between nine and five uh, weekdays, you know, crises can happen at very difficult times. And yeah, I mean, I've got three or four people who I could, you know, I don't know, let's say something awful happened and one of my children died or something, I don't know, who I could call people and they might go, oh, bloody hell, Chip, it's three in the morning. What the hell do you want? But if what, as soon as I told them, they'd be there for me. And I've yeah. got, I know who those three or four people are. Yeah. And And I don't ever want to be so complacent about the way I've, forged my friendships and maintained my friendships that if I'm in trouble and in a crisis, as I have been in, in sobriety, that they've got nobody to turn to. Uh, mm. I would, I would, you know, and I think that's another good, you know, we've looked at, you know, when was the last time you spoke to somebody in but what's your emergency plan? You know, when yes. something goes real, who's part, what's part of your emergency? And if you go, well, I don't know. I don't know what yeah. I do. Then you're. Then that's. Yeah. You've become. You've become complacent because we all need yeah. an emergent an emergency plan, and uh, yeah, and yeah, it might just be people that we just talk rubbish with for yeah. half an hour a week, but they're going to be there for us in an emergency, and unfortunately, yeah. you know, that's stuff happen. happens in life. It's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just all of like, um, not just AA, but smart recovery, women's yeah. sobriety, they all yeah. have really, they have some really solid principles and, yes. and practices. Yep. Practices are things we just keep practicing that, that just work. I've seen them work really, really well for people. The other thing is, I just also want to say in all of those groups, smart recovery, women's sobriety, AA, refuge recovery, whatever is your thing. I also think those are all usually peer led like yes. i yep. i owe a debt like i like I, this kind of like going somewhere getting sober and go oh good that i'm good now <laughs> like it it i just i really i dislike that in the I, I call steps. them i call them recovery thieves yes they yeah. come in steal all the good stuff get all the help yep. they need don't give anything then, back and don't give anything back yeah 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 and I don't like that. Yeah. We I have got, a debt. We, we have, have a debt. A debt. Yeah. I, I have a life today because people invested time with me, looked after yeah. me, helped me. Yeah. And I don't want to ever get so complacent that I don't yes. consider that. Well, yeah. what if they what if chip what if nobody had been there when I came in? Exactly. I was desperate. Yeah. I had no money. And it was, uh, what if there hadn't been, I was just, I was just in a meeting this Saturday and there was two women with their walking frames, hilarious. And they both, what, what best friends, one had got sober in 1974 and the Lovely. other one, and then 12 stepped her friend who got sober in 1975. I was born in 1973 and I was just like, I'm so honored to be in yeah. this room with you because I was a toddler yeah, and yeah. you were the, you were there and you're there and when I yeah. when I was a toddler I didn't know I was going to need you. I'm here because there's toddlers right now. Yeah, yeah. That are going to yeah. need me in 25 yeah. years or whatever, yeah, and yeah. I will be here like you with yeah. my. I didn't say my frame. I was like, yeah. They were real, like uh, I don't know. They were real. They were queenly. Yeah, yeah. They were ma majestic. They were really mm -hmm. incredible women. So, yeah, I think this has been a really good conversation, a good episode. I hope. Um, that it's you know kind of given people something to think about where are you being complacent and yep. what can you change because Absolutely. i'm gonna say it's we're we are long-term sober people and we are still very invested in the process of sobriety and so. recovery very and it's much we, so. yeah and it, it it's never gonna I, I will be doing this till the day i die i yep. i hope very much that's so do, I. so do i yeah yeah Thanks, everybody, for listening. Please give us a rating and send in your suggestions for any topics that you'd like us to talk about. And we'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.